we are able to offer a range of different courses with much more flexibility than a lot of other schools have to offer. And sometimes when you come to Burnside, it's difficult to see, well, there should always be value that you get from us, but you've got to take it with a grain of sand or grain of salt, whatever it is, because we are a big school. We've got large staff. Uh, we can specialist coverage most of the strands and single specialist stuff if we want to. <coughs> uh, we currently cover infrastructure, programming, media, information. And we're not doing electronics. And electronics, it's a shame that we're not doing electronics. Electronics is sits in that too hard to uh, too hard to deal with package for us at the moment because science has got to grab it. Just grab a seat. Science has got a hold on electronics. Technology has got a hold on electronics. And we want to get electronics, but electronics is something that we're going to look at once we sort of sort of these other programs are. Okay. It's, uh, it's important. Electronics is a huge industry. There's so much potential in electronics, and I'll show you a few things from electronics towards the end. But I don't know how other schools are coping with electronics now sitting in our strand, if, 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 if the department is starting to make a grab for it or not. But it's got an awful lot of potential, but an awful lot of baggage in a way. Um, all of that served us well at Burnside, as uh, as we know. But as Bob saying in 1964, I won't play the whole song because it's uh, times are changing. Uh, these standards are going to mean a huge amount of change for our subject area. So the change that's happened is the achievement standards have changed, the depth and the curriculum coverage has changed, the the fact that we're leaving unit standards behind is such a significant change and a lot of people don't realize the significance of that because it's a whole mind shift. And all of the other learning areas, even though they didn't use a huge amount of unit standards, the transition to NCA and the achievement standards and the standard alignment that goes with it is significant. It's a totally different way of doing things. And you're probably starting to work that out this year that they're totally different. Um, the pathways outside of school have changed. The jobs, the careers, we know those are changing. The software and the programs are changing. Everything's changing. Um, at Burnside, we're looking at other two <coughs> programs this Wednesday, and it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a big process for us because just this year, even looking at the level one standards. Um, we can see how much stuff is changing. And by the end of this presentation, this talk, I want you to hopefully I convey to you the amount of change that's sort of happening and how it's going to disrupt all of our programs because they all need to change to reflect these new assessments coming through. We can't have things that have stayed the same for a huge amount of time because <coughs> the higher levels have all changed. The standards, the, the expected knowledge, everything's changing, the new options. Okay? This year, all of our senior classes have changed, and we've started to combine classes. Uh, we're moving away from our single strand specialism, and what we're looking at offering at level two and three is now information and media, media and information, programming and infrastructure, introductory computing and generic technology. And the information features heavily because the kids that we teach, if, you, if you've got, if you look at all the kids in the school, 10% of them, max, maybe do ICT. So the kids that we teach, if we're teaching, if, we get, if we're lucky enough to get coverage in year 9 and 10, they're going on, and they are going into every other career. And the useful applications that they cover, a lot of it's going to come from information. So although we've got a huge amount of subject specialism in our senior courses, what the kids are using often isn't going to be... It, it suits us at our senior levels to do that, but if we're looking at the whole wider aspect, that information is hugely important. Um, programming infrastructure, introductory computing, and generic technology. The introductory computing has creeped in at level two for the first time because we know now that the kids coming from level one that cannot do level two need to have a new option at level one. And they've got to pick up something that's not the achievement standards at this stage because they're going to be too much and they're going to be require prior learning, which they never ever used to. 
a generic technology course. There's going to be a trial next year where it's just the generic standards and the kids are going to have free range with the project. Now, Burnside's a big school and with that, I was able to go through and pretty much select the best kids. And when I say best kids, I don't mean the academic kids. I mean kids that are highly driven, that are making websites at home or doing go-karts at home or making things at home and able to pull that into the classroom. And they'll work through a project where they're making something and they'll spit it out at the end. And it doesn't matter that they're all doing different topics because it's the process that I will go through. But what I'm hoping to see is that do those kids seize that and just charge off and become slightly inventors because I've got all of the like-minded kids regardless of the area. I've got kids from fabrics, uh, soft materials that are hopefully going to enter the wearable arts. That means they can spend their time with me learning process, how to do things, but they can also do it in technology and hopefully they will then leave my class and go over to technology and spend a huge amount of time in there making their stuff and come back to me when they need stuff and we will go from there. So it's a new way of approaching things. What these courses look like is still to be determined. So we've got a, a rough idea, but the actual standards that we're going to try to offer is going to be something different. Um, what we know now is that sending kids out that are experts in one area and nothing else is a disadvantage to them. So we can offer kids media at 11, 12, and 13, and kids can be doing just media at year 13. Okay? If they're doing that, when they go to NACTOL, they're actually at a disadvantage to a huge number of, to all of the other students that had much more generalist programs. It's taken us a real while to realize that. They used to have an advantage because it wasn't that long ago that web design was just HTML and CSS and putting those things together and incorporating a few things. But if you look at websites now, their programming, so much programming behind them, there's so much information that needs to be presented appropriately in them, and there's so many different ways of doing it. Kids that really were interested in computing and wanted to go away and do really well in their field needed to do media, programming, and information, and that was three subjects that they had to take at their inside if they wanted a well-rounded and balanced approach to leave school. Um, if you look at the, the, the stats that are coming out, if kids today will have seven to ten jobs, and it's not like seven to ten different jobs, they're bouncing around, siloing them in at high school is not really helping them. So we've got to give them a broader education, but still lead it as we move up through the stages in the curriculum. So really the days of our single focus courses is gone. We can't keep them. And if we're changing our senior courses, then we really need to look backwards at our junior programs. And our junior programs need to change because our junior programs need to scaffold up towards our senior programs. So even though this is level two, what I sort of want to do is go a long way around it so that you really understand the importance that if level one, level two, level three is changing and your programs are going to change, you have to change your juniors because Achievement standards aren't unit standards. The, the kids could come in, realistically, and do our old level three unit standards, and they could pick that course up for the first time. They can't do that anymore, so we've got to scaffold the kids up. And I'm going to hit on it later on, that, that if you are not beginning that pathway at the junior level, and starting to get them into that track of the different options and the different skills, one, you're going to struggle to get them into your classes, and two, you are going to struggle because you're going to be trying to cover content but you're going to have to backtrack and cover the prior knowledge that they should already have. Okay, so the junior program is going to be a, little, a lot more important. Um, introducing very simple blocks at 9 and 10, you can slowly build up to a level where you can assess at level 1, 2, and 3. And if you've got a really good year 10 program, you can see that your year 11s, those kids can potentially go on to achieve the excellences and merits at level 2, and your newer kids that are picking it up can, you can teach them to get to achieve merit, probably excellence, but you've got a good foundation in class, and you have to start thinking about that. No one can start teaching programming or media at level three with our new achievement standards. And if they haven't built up to it over time, they're not going to be able to do it, and you're not going to be able to teach it either. You're going to struggle. The 
the achievement standards have been through that curriculum alignment, which means that level two is the same standard as all other level two. We've spent a huge amount of effort. So when we went into the standards writing process and we said, this is sort of what we want, it had to go through several ringers of the ministry saying, but it's got to say this, because the other subjects do this, and these are the step-ups that happen between level one, two, three. It's not a case of saying, here's our wish list, we'll just turn it into a standard and throw it out. It, there was many other aspects that were going on as well. And level three, level three information is going to be level three English. The same level of complexity, the same level of demand. The days of having subjects that are really easy to do, compared to other subjects, is disappearing. Level 3 media is as demanding as Level 3 art. And if, if you go through your art departments and have a look what your art departments are doing, the work in there is absolutely fantastic. And they've had a huge amount of time to build up to that, to really work out what works, what to get the best out of kids. We haven't even had that opportunity because our Level 3s haven't even been released yet. So it is going to take us a long time to work out what really works for us. Once we've done that, a long time down the track, we will start to become a lot more standardized and offer a lot higher quality stuff across the board. And when you look out at the Google groups and you look at where people are, people are floundering a bit at level one because there hasn't been a standard. The unit standards were impossible to get an equal standard on. So if you were doing a, say, 5940, and I hit 5940 later on, the way people did 5940 and the level or what they expected from the kids was vastly different across a whole array. And some schools were disadvantaging their kids because of their higher expectations, and some schools were, schools were disadvantaging their kids by setting a lower expectation. Kids got credit, but there was no meaningful border between it. Okay? That's something that we're going to work on. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take an awfully long time. But it's why these groups are so important, because we can start to share work. And at the end of this year, we will start to see people throwing out things that really worked for them, or didn't work for them, or tricks they found, or ways of doing things. And hopefully we'll see some of that today. Level 3 programming. As demanding as Level 3 maths, if you're starting to teach the programming now, and you haven't taught it before, it is a huge step up, and it must have been difficult, because I haven't taught programming here, it must be difficult to teach it and then the next year have new kids come into the course, and you've sort of got a huge split level. That split level is going to go in some direction, because the prerequisites that, that you're going to expect are going to differentiate those classes less. You'll have more of the same kids in them. However, the, the flip side of that coin is that the level that those kids are going to be at is going to grow. And uh, walking around the classrooms at Burnside, I said this last night as well, walking around the classrooms at Burnside, in the level one classes, the programming and the media classes, they were doing some of the stuff that we were doing at level three previously. It's been that huge step up, okay? So, if that's the case, what's going to happen at level two and what's going to happen at level three are going to be really scary unless we scaffold ourselves in and get it sorted ourselves before we go. So this is level two course planning, and we need to think about this and share these ideas. And if someone is really good at something and has good ideas, the more we can throw it out and share and get things across, the more you're going to help someone else who's going to help you back later on. It's the way it works. Um, infrastructure is demanding as physics. Okay, if you, uh, There's no school in the country that would let you uh, pick up a level two chemistry paper or a level two physics paper if you hadn't done it at level one. Okay? And, and it's a rough jolt for us, but that's what's going to happen. And it's going to hurt our numbers and it's going to be difficult. But we will come out of that process as a more academic subject. If we need to have introductory computing courses for kids that are struggling, that's some of our concern, but it's not only our concern. That's the school's concern. The school has to provide courses for those kids that are struggling, but it also has to provide courses for the kids that aren't struggling. And there's nothing worse than being really bright in a programming class and not being able to do anything, or a media class or an information class and not being able to do anything because the teacher's catering it for a certain type of student. That's not differentiation, that's not classroom learning that, that we're trying to go through in this new curriculum. So, 
Junior programs need to reflect what's being assessed in the senior programs. There will need to be an overhaul in the junior programs. You will need to change the level of your content in the junior programs. You can't keep putting more into your junior programs. Teachers are terrible at finding new content and squeezing it in at the detriment of the other content. What we're going to have to do, and this is Burnside, is we're going to have to look at our junior programs and say, what do we want the kids to do at year 11? So we've got them all at year 9, and we see all of the year 9s. What do we need to offer at year 9 that is going to entice them to do it at year 10? Or is going to provide them an option, well not or, and is going to provide them an option not to do it at year 10, to go out and try some of those other curriculum levels, because they are curriculum subjects, because they're going to do it anyways, but then opt back in at year 11. And that's the problem that's facing us. In order to put stuff in at year 9 or 10, some of it is going to have to either be combined or it's just going to have to disappear and we're going to have to cut some stuff because science, when I was teaching science, there's so much stuff in science. It is so jammed full. There's no freedom in science anymore to do the fun stuff in science because you've got to get through so much content. And we've got to be careful as a subject that we don't get blocked into that where all of the fun stuff, the interesting stuff that we want to teach, we lose because we're so focused on jamming through content. And, and you don't realize it until it's gone that that's what happened. Right? The, the unit standards, one of the great things about unit standards is it, it, you can finish the unit standards quite quickly and you can teach so much stuff around the topic and it makes your courses really interesting and really fun, but you, we've got to make sure we don't go the wrong way. Otherwise, we're going to lose the bit of a better course that makes it really interesting, dynamic, it's full of change. Prioritize, discard some content. Junior programs need to allow you to capture your senior students. So, with this level two course planning, you need to have time at looking or devoting or thinking of your junior programs to get things sorted down there. If it's fun with the juniors and you've got kids coming through and they've got experience across those ranges, you will find them in your senior classes and they've made the right choices to get into your senior class. They're not sitting in level two media going, oh, I didn't actually really want to do this. It's too late then. Um, if there are gaps in their knowledge, then both you and the students will struggle at higher levels and that struggle won't go away at level two and it won't go away at level three and you'll really start to feel out of your depth and the kids will wonder what they're doing, etc. Use the scaffolding to build your own confidence. I don't recommend that you go and start teaching video or sound or whatever it is at level two if you are not comfortable with that. The best way, and it was talked about last night, trial it with your junior classes, get it sorted in juniors, create some new programs in juniors that are designed to fall over and fall flat when something goes wrong. And then once you fix those problems <coughs> and sort them out, then introduce them at level one and start assessing them there. It's you could probably sort out some of your level two or level one stuff and try it in year nine with the class because or year ten with the class at a very easy level because even if you're teaching some of the same stuff at year eleven, it's going to be worth it for the kids because they're going to have a double dip at it and really lift their achievement. And once you've got it sorted and you can teach it efficiently, then you can change your juniors again to try something else that you want to try later on. Um, don't try to start a topic that you're not comfortable with at level two, and I'm going to talk about these achievement standards a little bit later on, but they're not easy achievement standards. They were designed not to be easy achievement standards because they're level two achievement standards, like physics and chemistry and maths and English and the other ones aren't easy level two standards. Um, imagine starting chemistry at year 12 having not done it in year 11. It just doesn't happen. You walk in there and it would all be a foreign language, and that's what's going to start happening with our subject. But be aware that once you've established the skill in an area, you should be able to transfer the skills across to other media types. What you don't want to get trapped in is to think that because you're offering Photoshop, you've suddenly got to know Photoshop to an excellence level and know everything in Photoshop, and then Flash, know everything in Flash or animation. The skill that we're going to have to start picking up is start to work out what's expected at those levels and then transfer those skills. So what you expect to see at Photoshop at level one 
or level two or level three, you should be able to start to pick what you're looking for if the kids are working on flash animation. And it might not stick out obviously at the moment, but if you're looking at, if you're coming from, say, a special information background, you will know what a level one, level two, and level three information outcome is supposed to look like, and you will know the grade separations roughly in there. You should be able, with achievement standards, to almost look at the work and get a very quick indication or idea of achieve merit excellence, which you couldn't really do with the unit standard, because unit standards were all or nothing. And you could have fantastic work with the unit standard, and it could still be not achieved because they missed one thing. The achievement standards were different than that. Photoshop. I know what level 1, 2, and 3 should look like in Photoshop, and because I know what level 1, 2, and 3 should look like in Photoshop, I really know what level 1, 2, and 3 look across like most of the other medias. And I could see kids making a video, even without the technical understanding of the video, I should be able to see and have them explain to me what they've done and start to go, that's level 2, or that's level 2 merit skills that you're talking about, level 2 excellent skills that you're talking about. I don't need to sit there and learn the whole of Premiere Pro because we just don't have enough time to do it. Um, the level two, try it. the new achievement standards, yeah? The new achievement standards are starting to freak me out. Okay? They are not easy standards. The sitting there and going, wow, level one was requiring this amount of information and understanding to be done. Level two, I haven't even really started to sit down and think about it, but it's going to be a step up from level one, and it might be in a different media type, and it is starting to scare me. It took me ages to try to find a scary picture that wasn't too repulsive. Um, the kids love doing this sort of stuff in Photoshop, and, and the skill in there, and those pictures there, it's, it's the idea that's a huge part of it, to come up with something original, and if you s look for funny art or like scary Photoshop or interesting Photoshop, or you have a look at those, you can get some ideas. And you can start to, I was talking to people at Greenside the other day, what we need to start doing is, is building up a portfolio of, of outcomes from all over the show that demonstrate what level one, level two, level three skills look like. You can see them. If you go on the internet, you can find really bad Photoshop stuff that is a level one or below. And you can find really highly developed technical stuff that's a level three, and you can show the kids examples of that. If you're trying to hold all that knowledge or make them go out and search for it, they've got no idea. We need to have that and provide it to them. Um, I'm concerned because I don't think I've got the skills to teach imaging or animation at level three at the moment, and, and partly that's because I haven't taught anything other than year nines this year and last year. So I've been out of the loop with uh, seniors for two years. And if I sat down in a th level three media class and was trying to teach level three media skills, I would sit there and struggle. And it's because I am in scaffolding myself and I'm out to play the catch-up game because of that. Um, there has been no scaffolding or learning prior to this for me. And even across the school, there hasn't been a scaffolding of skills as you went through school. There's been unit standards that assessed blocks of skill in very short parts, but the unit standards didn't really have a step-up level that expanded on the previous level. They were more flashes of assessment that sort of covered what you wanted to teach because our subject had grown past that and we were still using them trying to catch up and trying to make sense of our program. And, and just looking at Burnside, the stuff we did at, 10, at 11, 12 and 13, those three levels at 11, it was, we, we focused heavily on information management because it was important for kids to have that. At year 12, they specialized. They did five unit standards in media and a small tech project at the end. The kids were smart enough to know that they'd already got all of their credits for level two at the end and didn't need to do the tech project, a lot of them. And then we went entirely into a level three tech project that was entirely tech standards and at a much higher level. And the kids, like looking back, the kids moving through that process, it was a different focused course every year they did it. It was, that's got to change and it will change because we've got the platform now for level two.
there's been a series of unit standards, but there hasn't been a curriculum block of knowledge that's been going through. And what I mean is that there's never been a level one achievement standard to unit standards that then led on directly to level twos that required from basic to advanced to complex. That's what's missing. All of the other subjects have had that, but they've had achievement standards and the NCA, but we haven't because we've been using the unit standards, which were just flash and isolated. So that leaves me in a bit of a pickle. <laughs> Um, the problem is that you want, I want students to be adept at the skills and knowledge of level two, but I don't want to become an expert in every different program and across a range of every different course. Mm. There's not time to do that anymore. It's impossible to do that now. It was possible to do it early on. It was hard work, but it was possible. But you cannot do it now. It's just there's too much out there. So if we look at our arsenal of, of what we've got. We've got these level two standards here. We've also got unit standards and we've got a whole pile of other ones, but I'm going to focus mainly on these ones because a lot of us have already used unit standards, not only to or we used get unit standards. So. In the unit standards, we've got a whole pile of our digital technology ones, and it doesn't really matter what your course is. Most of us can take them from here, and if you look on the Google Groups, most of the information is coming from here. But there is also a range of ones at the top here, and I'm going to come back and hit those ones shortly. I'm going to do it now. The Generic Technology Achievement Standards. These have a huge amount of baggage with them. Okay? A huge amount of baggage. They sit in the too hard basket. People have tried them. They didn't work. They haven't tried them again. It's easier to go with something you knew and to leave these things. There was too much writing. Okay? I can, I can show you examples that I show the kids and it just scares them the amount of work that they've got to do. And they were too difficult. Um, however, what I want to do now is really move into the achievement standards and look at some of those generic standards because later on throughout the day you're going to look at your other unit standards or your other achievement standards and the other options that you're going to get here. And what I want to do is provide a flash across some of those standards at the top so that they don't just become something that you see is on the matrix and then skip down and go, oh, there's only two digital information standards. How am I going to run a course on this? If we jump to 5940, here's 5940, and I'm going to jump back and forth through this. Everybody, everyone done 5940 at some point? 5940, just that standard, and it dropped down luckily from level three to level two because it was really just making a presentation. Um, and in there, there's the definitions and the elements and the performance criteria, and you go through and you plan it out and you make it and then you present it. When you look at the achievement standards here, there's undertake a brief development to address an issue, select and use planning tools to manage the development of an outcome, develop conceptual design for an outcome, undertake the effective developments to make a trial or prototype. People see these and they freeze because of those things that I said before, but if we were to flip back to this unit standard here, when you look through it, the wording is exactly the same in the unit standard. If you're doing unit standards, you've always been doing tech practice. You've just been doing it and incorporating it inside the unit standards. But it's been less work to do it this way. So when you look through here, a brief is defined as a clear description of both the desirable outcomes sought. Plan outlines the requirements of how the brief will be realized. When you pop over here, it means creation of the print thing. It means principles of screen layout. And you're looking at the legislation, etc. And the elements, one, plan and design. The plan identifies the purpose, it identifies the graphics, it provides a concept design. Um, number two is creating, which is the going through and the making one. And number three is going through and actually like creating the outcome that you're delivering. So in this one here, the computing unit standards that, that we used so well really find their basis in this technology matrix anyways, because there's undertake a brief development, select and use planning tools, develop a conceptual design, and make it. And I'm going to hit on those at some point. 
there. So the generic achievement standard we use assess the, side, assess the same content. And what, at the end of this, if you have time, is to look up some of those generic standards and just see and go, can you use them? Can you? And I'm going to show you ways that you can use them, but see if you can use them because they're more credits, they give you more time, you can teach the skills, and then you can use the unit standards for the kids to work on their own project, and you can offer a reassessment opportunity for the skills if they didn't make the skills the first time around. So you get a double dip, and I'm going to come into that in a second. Generic achievement standards are the same content as, this, as the unit standards is a sweeping generalization. However, the generics can and should be used to supplement our programs. They are very flexible. They are new, just like the digital technology standards are new. So we are starting from scratch from them. You can't think the digital technology standards are new, but the generics are the same old generics, so I'm not going to touch them, because you're doing yourself a disservice if you do that. If you make a start with them, they are going to be difficult. They're going to be just as full as, whole, as many holes as the digital technology standards are. Of course they are. But if we make a start now and we start looking at them as a larger group, we can increase the effectiveness of them and then we can increase, increase the ownership of them. Um, the tech standards are not meant to be textbooks. Right? The old standards turned into textbooks, and there's a reason for that, but they were never designed to be textbook creations. They're not meant for academics only. And they're not meant to be overwhelming. The people that made them overwhelming were us. Right? The teachers made them overwhelming. The teachers set the criteria of what needed to be done. And the teachers looked at what other teachers had done and thought that was all that was on offer. That's what we had to do. Let's not do them. The old technologies were all of those things. They were overwhelming, overwritten, and difficult. I think that was the third one. They crammed 20 credits that you can get now into eight. Um, they were vague, they were hard to assess, they were very academic, and they were full of confusing terminology. And even I still don't understand that terminology, and kids struggle with that terminology. Worst of all, they were often assessed with unit standard criteria, or they were tempted by teachers that only had unit standard experiences. And if you did unit standards, you knew you had to have everything done, and it all needed to be ticked off in a logical fashion for it to be achieved. And if you apply that to achievement standards, it doesn't work. And it won't work with our digital technology achievement standards. You will end up with standards that you are failing kids that you shouldn't fail because they demonstrated it, but they didn't say it the way you wanted to say it or in the right spot. So those things there, we've got to leave that behind. And that's going to be a process for the digital technology standards as well. And they were all combined, which is the worst thing. So if the kids stuffed up in one aspect, they potentially didn't go through and achieve the whole lot. Now, when you look at the matrix, it's not like that anymore. It's broken up into four. And we've already looked at the unit standards, and we've seen we've done those things. So those problems there killed them. Killed them for the kids, killed them for the teachers, killed them because the only way to pass them was to keep writing and writing and writing and putting more stuff in and hoping that at some point you'd included what was wanted, and then you would get moderated and it would be a pass. Okay? This really did mean these standards were well used in private girls' schools in these are 9 to 10 schools, and they weren't used anywhere else. Um, these standards are different. They got them wrong the first time, and they've learned from that mistake, and they've tried to change it. There'll still be problems with them. There always will be. But they can be used as a whole course of study now. They can be isolated. You can scaffold them from as you move up. They can be incorporated into the digital technology standards. They can be used as resubmissions. You can use your digital technology skills teach them skills, teach them a project, assess them on that, then give them a project where they go away and make something themselves, and you can look at that outcome and reassess the digital skills at the beginning if they, in the second project, if they had gone through, so it allows you a resubmission in there. It's six credits for the outcome, or for the concept design, which means that you can bulk up your courses at year 11 and really get the kids humming in a certain area. You can use them as extensions for really able kids, but you can also use them as remedials for, for kids that struggle. Okay? And the trick is going to be going through and looking for what you want. If you're doing planning, that planning standard at level one, if the kids can make a plan using not Gantt charts, if they can make a plan, I say not Gantt charts because planning is 
anything. You don't need to do Gantt chart. They could do bubbles. They could do um, brainstorms. Those things there. If the kids do that, they can go through and get an achieved. So you can use them to stock your program up. If you're struggling for time, you can put the planning one in, incorporate that into your other project, get the credits for that, and then have more time to focus on the stuff that you are wanting the kids to get through. Um, the kids can go through and do it. They can, if they're interested in a certain area or outcomes, if you've got kids in there that are really struggling at things, the tech standards with Achieve Merit Excellence allow you a range of things that you can do. You can set a project where you can get them to do things at a much smaller level. <coughs> you can start students off with them and then set them free and they can start coming up with their own outcomes. You can end up with your differentiated classes. Um, you can reassess that standard in different topics of work. So you could do it with Flash and then do a project in, in video and you could reassess a load of the same standards for the kids that needed reassessing and the other kids, instead of focusing on the planning, you could get them to do a little brief. You could provide the brief for them and then get them to do the planning. You could provide the brief and the planning. Imagine 594 if you wrote the whole brief out for them and the planning and then you just set them aside and said go away and make this and show me the changes you've made. So they offer an awful lot more flexibility. Reassess the standard in different topics of work. So, in conclusion, what I wanted to convey to you today is Decide, one, where you want to end up. Look at your junior program, start there, and then look at the standards on offer, but look at all the standards that are on offer. Look at those generics. Look at the criteria within those generics, because if you are... Um, let's see if I can just jump back to... If you're jumping... If you're... Uh, ignoring these things here, you're ignoring 20 credits of stuff that you are already very good at doing. So, if you are getting the kids to work on a project and you are spelling it out for them, you can start them on that. You can scaffold on them that at level one and get them sorted and then let them take over and really finalize what it is they're doing and assess them for the brief. You can start them off with their planning, provide the structure for them at level one, and get them to start moving through it and then let them go from there. And then in the second project, you could give them a reassessment opportunity. Develop a conceptual design. You could actually spend a little bit more time doing proper concept designs and you could teach fireworks or drawing program or doing things properly for a website or whatever it is. And if they go through and they make something without there's not stakeholders as much as there were, was in the old standards. You have to let the old standards go because they are gone. These are not the old standards. Design and make a prototype. If they make something, you can give them credits for that if you meet the criteria that are in there and you get six credits for it. It opens up and gives you an awful lot of flexibility in your programs to redo some of the stuff you've already done to cement it so that when they get into year 13, you really are hitting them with a very dedicated project. And I'm going to go all the way back. It's the problem with this one. <coughs> At level two, Grimside, what are we sort of thinking of doing? I don't know. This is what Wednesday's going to be. It's going to be a big discussion on Wednesday because. Um, the way we were doing things provided a very disjointed through fair for the kids. We might look at um, spelling mistake in there. Demonstrate understanding, the 2.42, the 2.43, which is eight credits there. I can go through and teach them Flash, or the media teachers can go through and teach them Flash, how to make a Flash interactive presentation, build on the stuff that was done at level one, and then we could say, right, you are going to make a Flash presentation show me your conceptual design, I want to see the structure of your flash diagram, I want to see what's going to happen, I want to see it built out. If you look at, a good example is um, like kids movies, Monsters Incorporated. If you watch that, at the end, Lion King does the same thing, it shows all of the other possible endings or out outtaken scenes, and it's just sketched diagrams of the way it was going to be done, and, and you can see the character development as it goes through and the scenes unfolding. That's going to be the stuff that's going to be really useful for kids in media if they're going to go into um, Weta or if they're going to be working with website design. They've got to be able to get the idea of what they're wanting to make across to the client without actually fully making it. The 
cost too much money to fully make it. And then, or, and, or, they could do the prototyping. If they do that, that's 14 credits that's there, and that's their course if they wanted to. I can decide on an external to put it in for course endorsement if I want to, but I'm really looking at a small number of credits for media. I've got to see if I can put a, incorporate the media stuff that I'm going to be teaching, or I said media before, is going to be in there, but I'm not going to assess the media. But I'm not going to accept really badly written work from them because their clients won't accept really badly written work for them. So I don't need to assess the stuff that I want from them at the media, and it doesn't need to be at level two media or information stuff I teach. It could be a reiteration of some of the stuff taught at level one, which is just backing it up in a media context, but I'm going to be expecting that stuff that's there. This is from the media one. Um, Bill has put up a programming one here, and I've got this one that I can uh, give to people at the end. This whole presentation is because it's online at Prezi, I can just share the link and then you can all have access to that presentation, so the stuff that's in here. And it's good because it allows you to put the content up and you can put stuff in. So Vilna's one is, you'll be able to see it, but she's going through, this is more for the programming people that are looking at that the, the, there. With the media ones, I stopped putting stuff in because I didn't want to put too much stuff in. With the information one next year, what I want to do is, is start thinking about an information and a media twist so that we get the kids doing their information standards and then they do a desktop published document or a magazine and they assess that from the media one because it gives the kids a nice crossover where they can see both separate areas. And in the long run, it sort of provides clear pathways for those kids to start making choices. And if they do leave and they want to do something in any field, the information stuff that they use, they can take with them and apply to whatever they're doing. Or the media ones, if they're doing a more media information focus, they go into print or design or whatever it is. If they're doing media, they can go to NetCol, but they're going to start knowing a little bit more about layout and design, structuring, and hopefully we'll start being able to do a little bit more with some of the programming basics in media because the web pages can't go away and do web page design without understanding some of the programming languages now. Um, that really is me for this one here. I haven't given you content like to say this is what you can do in your course because I could never do that because you're all so diverse. But hopefully you walk out of here and you say maybe I will have a look at 20 extra credit sets on offer and I'm not going to block them out because they're tech standards and they're too hard to do. Maybe I will try using them and I will send stuff away for moderation or out onto the group for people to look at. Because the moderators are not going to sit there and strangle you because you tried something with a achievement standard and it didn't quite work. That's what the moderators are, is to work out what judgments you're giving and why you're giving those judgments. And if we can start as a group to say, we don't want these kids to be writing booklets that are this thick, what we actually want them to do is to come up with a really good concept design that they can say, take to NACO and say, this is the project I did and here's my, my concept designs. I put an awful lot of work into them and I got six credits for them. That might be a step into NACO or a step into WETA or wherever it is. And that's what we've got to start looking at. Okay? The unit standard, the achievement standards, that eight credit horrible thing at level two and one and three doesn't exist anymore broken up into its components and you've already done all of those components in your unit standards. They're no different, but this way you can focus on just those aspects. Some people really like focusing on the planning and, and showing the planning. And Josh will talk to you later on. Once you leave, once the kids leave and they go out into media, they need to be able to structure a brief. They need to be able to tell their client what they're going to do. That someone needs to tell the programmers what's right. The programmers can't figure it out by themselves as they're going along because you don't make money like that. You need to be able to plan your time to be able to ensure that the project's going to have a start and a finish date. You can't get away from that. That's been part of all of our outcomes. You've got to have a concept design because you've got to have something that you're going to work from and to 
and you've got to have something that your client can agree with before you actually submit it to them at the end. And then the outcome's got to work, and it's got to be at the right skill level, so that it's not just a piece of junk that's come out, but they followed the right process to get there. And the fact that they're separate means that you can focus on the areas you're more comfortable with, or you could provide huge amounts of that to the students directly, so they don't need to write the brief, they don't need to sit there and do the planning, but they know exactly what to do when they launch into the concept design or the outcome. So for the teachers that say, I want to do more of the practical stuff, but some of those standards are hugely practical, because if you spell it out to the kids of what they want to do, you can then assess how well they met the specifications and the criteria. And when you look at all of your work, I'm almost done, all of your unit standards that you have assessed, you always clearly set out a brief of what you want the kids to do. You tell them the time frame that they've got to have it done by, and you expect them to be able to work to that. And you set specifications of what the thing must do, and then you give them time to go away and make it. You're doing it in your unit standards. These new achievement standards are much more like that because they're broken up. So that's me. What is probably a good idea now is to sit there and maybe try to digest some of that, or have a look at NZQA and look at some of those standards that are there, and some of you may not have even looked at them because they were tech standards, and see what actually is in them and what needs to be done, because then you can start asking questions on the Google groups of what people are doing and how they're going to resolve some of these problems, and you can go from there. Yep. Actually, it's probably going to be a good idea. I will hand over. You can talk about the standards. I'll look through them, and they do spell things out quite clearly. And it's really important, from my perspective, from talking to the tech people, they don't. The standards weren't written for you to have to build an enormous stack of work. They're after the process, and they're after certain things. I'll hand over to, to you. You can talk about the standards you've got because it's nice to have somewhere to like start and platform. Right, on. okay. When um, it comes to the level two standards, we're in the same boat as all of you in that, in that we're not sure exactly what they can look like until they're registered. Um, last year, obviously, there were some changes in the drafts. This year, we have been assured that they will be registered in December rather than what, 22nd of January or whatever it was this year. Um, and we are, we are offering... Um, Five digital technology standards, so resources for them. We're offering teacher's guide, learner workbook, assessment, marking schedule, and exemplars. And all, that, all those assessment materials are pre moderated by NZQA before we publish them. Um, so we're offering two point. Well, so far this year, in the level one, the 1.41, 42, 43, 45, and 46. Okay, so um, it's a digital information, two media algorithm and programming. Um, and then we've also, alongside them, the, the four generic technology standards, uh, 1.1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, we have taught the principles of brief development, but we have actually applied it in our teaching to a digital outcome. So we case study a student that's developing a website, for example, in the brief development, and on the way through. Um, and um, I've got fact sheets about more details of what we're going to be doing for the level twos. We've got samples of all the level ones out here. Um, but we've got fact sheets of what we're going to be doing in detail in the level twos. And I won't go into detail because I don't know it as well as our writer has that's written fact sheets, if you like. Um, but what I will say is that um, what John was saying about the, the marrying up the generic technologies with the with the digital technology standards, we've done that quite specifically, um, and we're doing it more so in the level twos than we have even in the level ones, um, because it just fits so well together. We're aware that um, we're offering you something which is generic, and you might want to do something very specific. So um, we, when we're talking about digital media, we can't teach in depth all different media types. Um, but we try and just sort of brush over them. So you might take our material and you might, um, you know, you might cut half of it out and not use half of it. Um, we, we, we're aware that we aren't here to give you what you should be doing. We're here to give you a tool 
that you can build from. And certainly when it comes to the assessment material, we want to give you something that gives you a good understanding of what, what does an achieve, what does a merit, what does an excellence look like. And we work really closely with NZQA on that because the, you know, this is new ground in the digital technology side of things. So we work really hard on that. I, I don't really want to um, talk a whole lot more about it, I guess, because you, each of you will use our material in a different way. Some of you don't like the fact that somebody else has prescribed what you should be teaching that, and, we, and I completely understand that. Um, but if you've got any questions around it, maybe I can help with that. Or um, probably the better thing to do is maybe come and see us later. Any questions around what it is? How many of you have used our unit standard resource? So, maybe half of you. Okay. So, our achievement standard resource is a bit different. It's certainly a step up in the same way as the, the requirement for the students is a step up. We've tried to create a step up in our, in our product, um, particularly in the teaching guides and the assessment material. Um, there's a, um, you know, we've tried to give you as a teacher many more options. So, we we provide a lot of notes for the teachers that students don't get, so you could possibly do this extension activity. Some of our extension <coughs> activities are about saying, okay, we've got some really good students here, what can we do to really ensure they hit that excellence mark? Um, but they might, you might end up with a class of students, and you know that most of them aren't going to hit excellence, so you don't want to teach to, that you want to get into those achievements and merits. Um, so, yeah, we're, trying, we're trying to create a, a product which um, enables you as a teacher to, to use it as it fits you. But we're aware that it's um, it's not going to fit everyone. So um, we welcome you to come and have a look at what we have done for the level ones, and uh, if it's something that might interest you for level twos as well. We are hoping to have the first of the level twos out, 2.41, 2.42, before halfway through term one. Very optimistically by about week two, but. Um, it's assuming a couple of things. NZQA has up to six weeks to pre-moderate, and if we have to change anything, they get another six weeks to moderate that again. Um, but they've only been taking about two weeks in the digital area. So um, if they continue to do that, it'll be very early term one that we'll get them out. Um, but if they don't, and it is over the summer, um, if they take a little longer, then we're at their mercy, really, when it comes to um, how quickly we can get things out. But like I say, we do have a, a basic brief there of what we will be doing with them. What questions do you have? Cost. Basically, the level ones are for an electronic copy, um, $300 odd dollars. If you want the hard copy, it's another $75. For the level twos, will be slightly more than that. They'll probably be about $330. Now, that's for a, a, a license to use them for the lifetime of the standard, or I should say the lifetime of the version. Um, when the versions change, as I'm sure they will, um, it, it's a, you get a discount price, it's about a 40% discount price for your update those. So once you pay for it once, you're not paying full price in the end. Um, we think it's a really good value for money, and, I, and I'm aware that you also have budgetary constraints. But for us, it's take, costing us for each of our digital technologies material. I mean, even for pre-moderation, it costs us $960 plus GST per assessment. Um, so that's what NZQA charges us. For us, it's costing us eight to ten thousand dollars per standard that we're developing resources for. So we think for us to offer them to you at three hundred dollars is pretty good value. Um, and obviously, we rely on um, the goodwill of teachers not to share them with each other as much as uh, as much as we agree with sharing content. Unfortunately, our business model doesn't work with that. Um, yeah. So we offer a PDF of everything and a Word document of the learner workbook so you can modify it, customise it, and our license lets you change up to 10% of that. Um, and if you want to change more, um, we're usually good with that. It's just clear understanding who owns copyright still. So just have that discussion. The other question that I often get from um, people in your uh, subject area is can we cut it up and put it on Moodle or something like that? And the short answer is yes, as long as it's only accessible by students in your school. So if it's in any public domain, then no. But if it's only accessible by students in your school, then you should handle that. So feel free to come and see us in the breaks. We'll be set up in the staff room and give you an idea of what it is we have. The last thing I'll do is um, keep having all the last things. This here was the uh, project that one of the kids went through 
can make this here so it doesn't really look like ICT. It's an awesome track. But Logan Glasson went through and he won. He came first place in the ETITO, the electronics um, contest, the Bright Sparks contest. And what he did is he knew that Doc, when they set their traps, they'd have to go and check each single trap as they went down the line. So what he did was he made some, uh, there's a little receiver in there, and he went through and made, I wonder if I've got one of the receiver points, I'll all be in here. He made a mesh monitoring pest trap system where each of these is fitted with a wireless device that sits in there. And the trappers, I think, can use their cell phone and they can go along to the first trap, get the signal, and it will say which other traps have been set off. And it will tell them which trap it is. And if one of the traps fail, it will re-network itself to come back through another way. Now, he did that. That was a... He's a very good guy. And the, the stuff he did in there... It was a struggle to assess because I had no idea what he was talking about. The circuit <laughs> diagrams and stuff. But it was pretty safe to go through and say, this is obviously an excellent standard. And, and everyone that's seen it's agreed. I mean, you don't win the, the um, first place for something that's not. But he went through and he worked on this with, with very little supervision because it was something he was going to work on anyways for this project. Mm -hmm. And giving him the standards meant that he got recognized at school for those, those mm -hmm. credits. And the learning he did here, well, he could have really written this up and submitted as a scholarship. He's only year 11. So he's, um, th there's those kids that are out there, and there are going to be more and more of them that are out there if our, pro if our projects and our courses are wide enough to, to take those kids that have got those interests. Um, the, yeah, looking through the stuff he's written up for, oh no, the, the write-up. On here, I started to get trapped into asking him to do loads of write-up for this to explain his decision-making process. And in the end, what I did, and I talked to the tech advisors, and I'm going to submit this for moderation to see how it goes, is I got him to draw a couple of huge brainstorms or brain dumps on big A3 bits of paper. And then I gave him an iPad, and he set that up, and he just talked to it and explained what he'd done in this project. So he just looked at the diagram and he said, this is what I've done here, this is what I've done here. That's the assessment he's gone through. He could clearly do it. He had his chart, his planning chart that he went through, and he was able to talk through his planning chart and do that. And that's where the assessments are flexible enough and they can start to change to bring those sort of things in. I'm going to try next year with this generic course is, is having kids where they've got to do those video journals where you, you see them on, on YouTube where it's someone just talking straight into the screen and short snippets of what it is mm -hmm. and then just creating a timeline as they go through little short videos. And I'm going to spend the first two weeks of next year's course with them because I've got a level one, two, three combined class of just getting them to get used to talking into the video camera and explaining little short snippets that doesn't become overwhelming mm -hmm. and when they're looking for the evidence of what these kids have done, the moderators can look in there and, and no doubt they will find loads of information as to where it is. So there's different ways of doing it, there's different ways of presenting it. Diane, who's up? Oh, right, okay, There's also, um, there's loads of different ways of presenting this content. The e-portfolios are starting to make their way into secondary school. They're huge for providing, presenting online content. There's Google Docs where the kids can have presentations and PowerPoints. And it's up to us to start to incorporate those other ideas in, not teach them. The kids need to work that out. It's part of their project to work out how to actually do it. And it's us offloading, being the expert at the front that holds all of the keys, and standing away and letting the kids fall over, strangle themselves, and do all of those sort of problems, and then learn from that process. And it's not easy doing it because it is much easier to have a very structured classroom where everyone's doing the same thing and everyone's working on the same project. And da, 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 da. But once they go into the environment that they're going to be working, it's not like that. You go and you look at web design firms or, or video firms or whatever it is, they're working on multiple projects at once all over the world and people are, what they want is people that can talk together and solve problems together. And there's, there's so many people out there that are skilled and, and you can tell them what to do and they will do it.
there's not so many people out there that can think and come up with new ideas and to try to come up with a new way of doing something or presenting something in a new way. And unfortunately, those old tech standards run the life out of that process because people were using them and looking at the exemplars and seeing what other people were doing <coughs> and everyone was drifting towards this exact same way of doing it. And when you mark level one, two, or three achievement standards, they were all the same. They should be this wide range of where you do a whole pile of different things, but they were all the same thing. Everyone across the country did these huge Gantt charts. And kids had no idea what a Gantt chart was, and they were only doing them because they knew they would fail if they didn't do them. Mm. Kids can't do Gantt charts. I've learned that. It took me a long time. Gantt charts are only useful if you know what your steps are and your outcomes so that you can actually put them in the right place and track yourself as you're going. If you were learning to do planning, you can't learn to do planning by doing a Gantt chart. All it is is these flashy colors and this line that you draw in and then you go in and do all the stuff that you're supposed to be doing and then you come back to it ages later and go, oh, oh okay, I'll quickly doctor another one and make this line out here and say, oh, my revision point was here and this is where I did some critical review here. And you're not doing any of that. So what we need to do with these new standards is if that's important, and it is, take the power back, do what you want to do, assess it, come up with new ways of doing it for our subject, and then sharing it around so other people can see it so that we don't have the whole community making huge, elaborate 50-page Gantt charts that the kids just don't understand and, and it kills their interest in the subject. Or the brief where you're stakeholders, where you're strangling the kids through this process doesn't need to be that complicated. There's better ways of doing it. We just need to find them. So I would really recommend that the now. How much time we've got left? It's still about. It's still a, a huge chunk of time. To have a look. When does this one finish? Uh, heaps of time. Look at some of those standards and have a talk amongst yourselves. I'm keen. To, I'll sit here and I'll answer any questions that people have got or just things there, but do have a look and see if there's something in there that could be useful to fit into your subject area. It's your chance to do it now.